Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today for our webinar on accounting hotspots for credit unions. My name is Ali Lamberski, and I am a credit union training coordinator here within the Office of Credit Union Resources and Expansion here at the NCUA, and I will be the, your moderator for today's program. Before we begin, we just have a few brief administrative announcements. Please feel free to adjust the volume on your computer as needed, and please allow all pop ups on your computer to have full visibility of all material that will be shown today. Um, if you are having any issues, please use the Q and A feature at the right hand side of your console window. Please reach out to our tech support team using that Q and A feature, and they will be with you right away to assist. In approximately two weeks, a recording of this webinar will be available for on-demand viewing on our learning management system. This material will feature a closed caption video, like I mentioned, as well as the ability to download a PDF version of today's PowerPoint presentation. To access these additional resources, you do have to have an account on our learning management system, or LMS, as you may hear it referred to. The good news is there is no charge for account setup. It is a completely free resource available to all credit union and employee, all credit union employees and volunteers. To access our learning management system, please go to ncoa.gov slash support services, select credit union resources and expansion from the drop down menu, and then further select learning. From there, you'll be redirected to our learning management system where you'll be able to create an account with us. After creating your account, please allow about 24 hours for all content to be uh, fully available to you. We have over 300 courses at the moment, so it takes a little bit to load onto your account, but it will be there with full access for you. As always, I also have our NCUA disclaimer that I must read out to you. The materials presented in this webinar are intended as an informative and educational summary of general information on common issues seen in, a credit, in credit union accounting. The NCUA has taken reasonable measures to ensure the quality of the data and other information produced by the NCUA that's available in this presentation. The NCUA, however, makes no warranty expressed or implied, nor assumes any legal liability or responsibility for the accuracy, correctness, or completeness of any information that's available through this presentation, nor represents that its use would not infringe on privately owned rights. The slides are intended for educational and discussion purposes and do not constitute legal advice, nor replace independent professional judgments. Reference to any specific commercial product, process, or service by trade name, trademark, manufacturer, or otherwise does not constitute an endorsement recommendation or favoring by the U.S. government or the NCUA. This is our agenda for today's webinar. We will have introductory remarks given by the Director of Resources for the for Cure, Christy Kubista Hovis, in just a few moments. I will then introduce our speakers today for both our presentation and for our question and answer session. I'll then hand it over to our presenter for accounting hotspots for credit unions. And then if time permits, we will have a brief Q&A session. So please, like I mentioned earlier, submit any questions you have using that Q&A feature at the bottom right hand side of your console. And then we will close out our webinar with any upcoming events and contact information. We have our polling question as always for every webinar that we do. So I would just like you guys to go ahead and take a moment and provide a response just to help us have an understanding of who is joining us today for our webinar on accounting hotspots. So our polling question is, what asset range represents your credit union? A, zero to 50 million, B, 51 to 250 million, C, 251 to 500 million, D, 501 to 1 billion, E greater than 1 billion or F not a credit union. So I'll go ahead and pause for just a few moments to allow everyone a little bit more time to go ahead and answer our polling question.
All right. And it looks like we are slowing down on that poll. So everybody or a good majority was able to get a response in. And we have a great mix of credit unions with us as always. So I hope that regardless of the size of your credit union, you find the information shared today very helpful and are able to take back some of these lessons. I'm now going to turn it over to my director, Christy Kubistahovis, for brief introductory remarks. Christy? Thank you, Allie, and I'll keep it brief because I know the introductions are not what you're here for. So I just want to say thank you to everyone who's attending today. Uh, this webinar has, has been a massive success already in that we had more applicants or people sign up for this webinar in an hour than we usually have in a week to two weeks. So we're very excited about um, your level of interest. I am Christy Kubistahovas. I am the Director of Resources here at CURE, and my we are in, in charge of all of the training and development, as well as the grants and loans and the MDI preservation program. So we're here to help, to support, um, and to facilitate your learning. With that, I'll, let, I'll turn it right back to Allie to begin. All right, thank you so much, Christy. And before we get started, I'm just going to briefly introduce our speakers because like Christy mentioned, I know that you are really here for them and you guys are all very kind and are wonderful listening to admin announcements, but I'll make this quick for everybody. So facilitating our presentation today is Sonia Pickens. Sonia Pickens began her career with the NCUA as an examiner in New Orleans, Louisiana in 1991. So she has been an examiner for 24 years before becoming a national training specialist and helping to prepare our examiner staff both in the classroom and in the field. This allows them to better serve credit unions and protect the National Credit Union Share Insurance Funds. Sonia assists on credit union exams each year and consults with new examiners about accounting issues they see in the field. In addition, Sonia is a certified public accountant licensed in Louisiana and a certified fraud examiner. She also holds a bachelor's in accounting from Mississippi State University. And then assisting with Q&A today, we have Chris McGrath and Trey Dameron, who are joining us from the Office of Examination and Insurance. Chris McGrath is NCUA's Chief Accountant, and he serves the credit union industry with advice and guidance on the application of generally applied acceptance accounting principles, excuse me, all of those A words, all in one go. Um, for the NCUA, he has served as its budget officer, as well as leading financial reporting on its insurance fund. McGrath is a certified public accountant licensed in Maryland and Virginia, and for over 15 years has been an adjunct professor at Georgetown University teaching accounting, finance, and economics. Trey also supports ENI's division of the chief accountant as a senior policy accountant. He joined the NCOA's office of the chief financial officer in 2012 as an accountant focused on financial reporting, governance, risk, and controls. And he was instrumental in the NCOA earning a clean audit opinion, uh, clean audit opinions on its funds accounting for losses on taxi medallion loans and closing of the temporary corporate credit union stabilization fund into the share insurance fund. Trey is also a certified public accountant licensed in Virginia and holds a bachelor's of business administration in accounting from William and Mary and a master of business administration from the University of Illinois at Urbania Champaign. So now I will go ahead and turn it over to Sonia to begin our presentation. Sonia, welcome and thank you for joining us. Thank you, Allie, and I am going to start sharing my presentation here. Okay, so hi everybody. I'm so glad that everybody could join us today. Um, like Ali said, I was an examiner um, for many, many years in primarily in South Louisiana and South Mississippi, where we do have a large concentration of very small credit unions. And so what I really wanted to talk to you about today is some things that I have seen many, many times in credit unions um, accounting uh, errors or issues that led to uh, the credit union having to make large one-time unexpected adjustments um, to expense items that could have possibly been um, accounted for in a different way so that they didn't have these large expenses. And so what I want to talk about today are some of the common ones that we've seen, um, and that is booking prepaid and accrued expenses, some bank reconciliation issues that we see, 
um, deficiency balances, and we'll explain that when we get there, foreclosed and repossessed assets, and I know that's a, very much a hot topic right now, and also the allowance account funding. Funding, And we've already had some questions come in on a couple of these topics, um, and we'll get to those as we go. So the first one I want to address is the difference between prepaid assets and accrued expenses. So prepaid assets are things that are paid before the expense is incurred. So for example, an insurance policy. You pay your insurance policy, let's say at the beginning of January, that covers your whole year. You can book that as a prepaid as soon as you pay it and then expense it over the life of that insurance policy. So the expense is recognized steadily over the whole life of that asset or that insurance policy. So that's fine, that's gap, um, and that's something that is okay to do. Um, supplies can also be done like that. Um, equipment leases, and equipment leases are a little bit different. Uh, there's newer guidance that says when you have an equipment lease, like a copy machine or something like that, uh, or even leased property, you have to also book an asset for, uh, it's called a right of use asset, and you would you offset that with a liability, a lease liability on the um, other side of the balance sheet. So that's gotten a little bit more complex over the years than it used to be, but you can still book the expense as a prepaid if you pay it upfront. Um, okay, so when we run into problems is when credit unions try to book something as a prepaid that can't be a prepaid. So for example, um, audit fees, employment taxes, annual meeting, accrued vacation. All of these things are paid after the thing happened. So for example, um, employment taxes. Employment taxes are paid after the person has worked um, or accrued vacation time for your staff. That's paid out after they have a, have built up the time. Um, some credit unions, small credit unions, do accrue for their audit fees every year um, or for their annual meeting every year. That is kind of a, a iffy area. Um, GAP says that those things should be expensed when they happen. Um, so the audit fees should be expensed when the uh, work is performed and your annual meeting should be booked when the annual meeting happens. Um, but there's long-term practices for small credit unions who don't officially have to follow GAP, but we highly encourage you to follow GAP in any way that you can, um, that will accrue those fees and the annual meeting expense over the period of time prior to it happening. So you're still applying the expense to the period of time when the thing happened. So for example, over the audit period. Um, again, that is not a gap um, practice, but it could be appropriate in small credit unions. You, would, you need to talk to your auditors, um, talk to your accountants before you choose to do that. But the bottom line is if you have booked your audit fees, for example, as a prepaid expense, that you can't do that. If, we're, if we see that, we're gonna have to get you to fully expense that right, right then, because that does not apply to a future period, which is what a prepaid does. So that's really what I want you to get out of this. You cannot book these kinds of things as a prepaid asset and then expense them over a future period, okay? Um, okay, that is that. Um, and that's just kind of a little synopsis of it. What is the difference? Um, okay, so to fix that, to make sure that you're not doing that, just make sure you understand the difference between what is a prepaid, which, which is something you've already paid that covers a future period, 
and what is an accrual, which you've already saved up for before you pay it. Okay, um, some bank reconciliation issues. I'm sure you are all aware that bank reconcilia reconciliations, bank account reconciliations are something that we look at every time we walk in your credit union. They are so critical because if we don't have confidence in your bank reconciliations, then we have a lot of uncertainty in the overall presentation of your financial statements. We can't, we don't really have a lot of confidence in what your financial statements say if we can't be confident that your accounts are reconciled. You have a lot of complex things running through those accounts. Um, and we have to be able to see that your reconciling items on those uh, accounts are reasonable, timely, they make sense. You're able to give us the detail of what is in each of those reconciling items. So let, a reconciling item is just something that explains the difference between what the corporate credit union or bank says you have and what you say you have on your general ledger. So those items, the most common ones are going to be things like outstanding checks. You know, you wrote checks over the month. Some of them cleared, some of them didn't. The ones that didn't clear are going to be listed on your reconcilement. Those things make sense. Um, deposits in transit. Uh, you know, you've got deposits in on the 31st of a month, and they may not get to your correspondent financial institution until the first day of the month. Um, and that's reasonable. It makes sense. We're going to look to see that those deposits in transit clear um, the, you know, within the next day or two so that they clear in a timely manner. Where I see credit is getting into some problems is when certain things happen and they just, the item just keeps getting carried and carried and carried on the reconcilement. So your ACH files, if you have an ACH file, for example, that comes in and you're, for some reason, it, you, it doesn't get posted. Um, somebody's on vacation that day, it just gets missed, whatever happens. Um, you figure out that that file has not been posted but you don't do anything about it. You don't, you're, you try to work with whoever it is to you know, get the funds back or whatever it is, but you're just carrying it for a long time on your reconcilement. That affects your members accounts. If you have not been able to take that money from your members or post those transactions to your members accounts, that's an issue. Um, they may or may not still have the money in their account. So you may have a collection issue that is tied to that. So we don't like to see those things hanging out there for a long time, not being resolved, either written off or corrected or whatever has to happen. Um, share draft returns, ACH returns. When we're seeing those not happening timely, again, that can affect your members' accounts. And so there's a reputation risk issue there as well as a, an issue with our confidence in what your financial statements are saying. So we wanna see those reconciling items being cleared up very quickly. Um, and that when we see returns on a bank reconcilement that you're able to tell us in detail which returns those are that you're waiting for credit for. Um, okay, I've seen this a uh, hundred times. I don't like seeing on a reconcilement just a big lump sum amount with an explanation that says timing difference. I understand what a timing difference is, okay? You know, your cutoff is four o'clock and your ATM cutoff is five o'clock or whatever it is. I get what that means, okay? But you should be able to show me every individual transaction that makes up that amount that's in that timing difference. And where I see credit unions get into trouble is when the timing difference clears clean every day, the next day it's clean until it's not, okay? When it's not clean, 
then the credit union sometimes doesn't know how to go drill down into those individual transactions to see what didn't clear. So you got to make sure that even though you know you're checking these boxes and it clears every day, um, the next day, however it works, that you know if it doesn't, how to go research what those items are. Okay. Um, you have clearing and suspense accounts associated with your transaction accounts. Um, you've got to include those in your reconciliations. Every one of those clearing accounts or suspense accounts, however you have them labeled, where files are being posted and transactions are being posted to members' accounts, have to also be reconciled. And they should not have anything hanging in there for a long time. They should be clearing. They're, you know, they, they're likely not going to clear to zero every day. Some do, some don't, most don't. Um, but the amount that's left in there at the end of every single day, you should be able to tell us or show us the individual transactions that make up whatever amount is still hanging in those suspense accounts. Um, and they should be recent, like super recent and clearing out of there within the next couple of days. Um, I've seen this a bunch of times too, unfortunately, um, descriptors on your reconcilements. I've seen descriptors that say reconciling item or unknown or plug figure. Um, these are things that make examiners very nervous, okay? Because what that says to me is, I don't know what this amount is. This is the number I had to stick on there to make my reconciliation balance. Um, that is not a good thing. I actually saw one at a credit union many, many, many years ago that said ESP. That was the descriptor. I asked the manager what that was, and she said, oh, that means error someplace. Okay, that means that I'm gonna have to do a lot more digging and looking at your reconciliations to make myself feel confident that there's not money either missing or lost or, or whatever. So we take those reconciliations super seriously. I am sure that you guys have had that experience with us. Um, and um, yeah, so these are, that's just some heads up, some things that we see commonly become an issue. So <clears throat> again, your reconciling items should be recent, clearly identified, corrected timely, um, and don't forget those clearing or suspense accounts, okay? Uh, okay, so that is bank recs. Um, errors or unidentified differences in your bank statement are going to make us uh, have a concern about whether or not your financial institutions are following GAAP or if they are following our full and fair disclosure rules. Um, again, it's going to increase your reputation risk, and it's going to just make us kind of question your fundamental understanding of how those transactions flow through the credit union. Um, so. Big deal. Um, okay, deficiency balances. I've also seen this a bunch of times. So a deficiency balance is basically, um, you let's say you repossessed a car um, or the, a car gets wrecked. A car that is collateral on a loan gets wrecked. You get an insurance settlement from um, the borrower's insurance company and when you apply that insurance settlement to the loan, it advances the due date way out into the future. And then it kind of gets lost in the system, right? I mean, I've seen these things get advanced years, three years, four years, and that loan is never going to show delinquent until it hits that mark where, you know, three years or four years or however far out it got pushed down the road. Um, what we like to see you guys doing is monitoring those pay to head loans to make sure that none of them are deficiency balances. So um, I always recommend to my credit unions that they do one of two things. Number one, you are probably most likely able to set your core processing system 
so that it will not advance more than 30 days or 60 days, no matter if the borrower brings in, you know, extra payments or they get an insurance settlement or whatever it is. And I've seen a lot of credit unions do that, set that system so it will not advance the due date more than 30 days, 60 days. Because really, that's what the contract with your member says. It says you are going to pay monthly, bi-weekly, or whatever it is. And extra payments that the borrower may voluntarily make should, in effect, shorten the term of the loan, not allow the member to skip payments. And that's aside from skip a pay programs and all that. I'm just talking about if they're making, you know, if they're paying a thousand dollars a month instead of their stated payment of three hundred dollars or whatever that is. That still technically should shorten the term of the loan, not allow them to skip. Um, I know that many, many credit unions do not like this idea. Okay, they don't like the idea of not letting the date advance. I can live with that. And again, disclaimer, this is not official agency guidance. This is my opinion, okay? As an examiner, I'm okay with that. I'm not okay with it on real estate loans or big business loans, okay? But on consumer loans, I can live with that as long as somebody in the credit union is doing some work to make sure that those loans aren't falling through the cracks, like the deficiency balances or, or loans like that. So what I like to see is that there is a formal process where somebody in the credit union or the supervisory committee is looking at a paid ahead loan report at least monthly or and or a loan a report that will show loans that are not delinquent but have not had a payment in the month those can also show you paid ahead loans um and and then making sure that loans are paid ahead for a legitimate purpose. So they are paying $1,000 when the stated payment is 300 or they brought in a big lump sum payment or whatever it is. And not that it was an insurance uh, an insurance settlement on a wrecked vehicle that the borrower has no intention to pay the rest of. Um, what happened, what can happen is if we come in and we find a bunch of deficiency balances on your books, we're going to have to make you write those off right then and there. Uh, and I have had a couple of credit unions that have had to do that. And it was a huge expense to them because they had a large volume of, of uh, deficiency balances. So we don't want to see that happen. Um, okay. A quick word about non-accrual status. This is some questions that have come in uh, ahead of time. And there's always a lot of questions about non-accrual loans, delinquent loans. When are those deadlines? What are what are uh, those procedures? The thing that I find that the credit unions I work with get the most confused about is non-accrual status has nothing to do with your collections on a loan. Okay, non-accrual status has to do with when you recognize the income from the interest on the loan. Most of our very small credit unions that are not required to follow GAAP, 10 million and less, are not accruing interest on loans. They're following a modified cash or cash basis of accounting as far as loan interest goes. So they are not recognizing interest on loans before they receive the payment, but all the other credit unions that are over 10 million should be doing that. Non-accrual status means you stop recognizing the income that has not been actually paid yet on your loans. It does not mean that you have to stop charging interest to your members, okay? So I wanna make sure that that um, helps clear that little uh, argument up, okay? You still have all of the rights, according to collection rules, um, to collect the interest on those loans. Um, and rolling into that topic a little bit more, um, foreclosed and repossessed assets. So this is another issue that's um, 
come up a lot more recently because I think we've just, it's just been kind of on our radar a little bit more. It's really been this way for a, a long time. Um, but it's, like I said, it's on our radar more now than it used to be. So when you foreclose on a property or you repossess a loan, a car, a vehicle, boat, whatever it is, you are supposed to be writing down that asset to fair market value, charging off the amount that is uh, of the loan that's above whatever the fair market value of that vehicle is, for example. If it's not, then when we come in and we look at your foreclosure and repossessed property, it could be that we might have to make you write down a whole bunch of stuff at one time. And I can promise you that there are no examiners out there that want to have to make you do these entries that cause a big expense to the credit union. That is not something any of us, I, I will speak for all examiners on this, uh, it's not something that any of us want to do or like to do. However, comma, we also very much recognize that if you haven't done that, then your financial statements are not fully and fairly stated. And that is a critical piece of um, us making sure that we have confidence in your financial position. Okay, so in order to avoid having to make this huge write-off of a bunch of different property at the same time, you want to make sure, per our call report instructions, that you have written those items down and that you periodically evaluate the value. And if it has fallen further in value, that you continuously make those entries over time um, as long as you hold that asset. Now, here is a complicating factor. I am aware that there are credit union core processing systems out there that can't handle a partial charge off. So you, you just can't do it in your system. So if your system does not allow a partial charge off, the sort of unofficial um, workaround for that is that the examiners will likely tell you to fully reserve for whatever that amount is that you should be writing the, pro the property down in your allowance account or in another uh, sort of reserve account that will net against foreclosure and repossessed assets so that you have on your books uh, a negative, a contra asset that offsets the value of the property. Again, that is not GAAP, that is not official agency guidance, okay? That is a, um, a matter of practicality when your system doesn't allow that partial write down, okay? Uh, I think more and more systems do allow it now than they used to in the old days, but there's still, I know a few out there that won't let you do a partial charge off. Um, okay, and this is just some more guidance straight from the call report. We chose the the um, call report instructions to, to give to you because that's, to me, a very clear guidance. It, it's easy to understand. Um, so those call report instructions are a great place to go whenever you need a little bit of clarity on what we expect in these different uh, accounts. Um, okay, so in order to solve this issue or make sure you don't have this problem, you want to um, adjust those assets as you repossess or foreclose them, and you want to at least quarterly review the value of those assets and make sure you write them down further if that's what needs to happen, okay? Um, okay, so now our our last topic that I wanna talk about before we get into the Q&A is the allowance account. And I know this is a huge, huge topic. It always is. Um, and even more so now that we have gone to Cecil. So, Small, I don't know if everybody knows this, but small credit unions, our credit unions under $10 million in assets, do not have to follow CECL. You are able to basically use the same method that you have been using. Um, 
But we have some general issues and problems that happen around allowance accounts, regardless of what the methodology is. So these are some of those issues. If you are not charging off your loans timely um, and or writing down property like that, like we were just talking about, timely, then your methodology is going to be skewed because the factors that you're applying to your loan pools are not going to be accurate. I mean, I use the term accurate in regards to the allowance account loosely because it there is no accurate. Um, it's reasonable is what we're looking for. Um, but they have to ref those factors have to reflect what you've actually lost in your loan portfolios. And if you're not charging off timely, it can be a big effect. And when we come in and look at it during the exam and see that your loss factors um, or your Q&E factors don't reflect what you've charged off or what needed to be charged off, then we're going to have to probably have you make a big adjustment to increase the allowance count. And that's not going to make anybody happy. Um, I have seen credit unions try to spread out the expense over time that they need to fund the allowance account. So, for example, let's say your methodology says that you need to put $100,000 in the allowance account. Well, unfortunately, you have to put $100,000 in the allowance account. You cannot decide to fund it by $25,000 over the next four quarters to make up the $100,000. That is not GAAP. Um, that is not fully and fairly disclosing your financial statements. So you have to fund it based on what your methodology says. That can be up or down. It's not great to have a large overfunding in your allowance account either because that also will skew your financial position. Um, so we don't want to see that either. Um, a lot of us as examiners um, and as credit union officials sometimes want to beef up those allowance accounts because, you know, it just makes us feel better about, uh, you know, to have a bigger cushion in there. But there are problems with that. Uh, your assets are understated. Um, it can delay recognition, recognition of provision expense when provision expense needs to be recognized. I've seen a lot of small credit unions way over fund the allowance account and then it takes you know it can take a couple of years even to kind of use up that overfunded amount and in the meantime budgets have been made strategic plans have been made based on a very understated um, expense profile so no provision expense or very little provision expense when that's really not correct. The provision expense should have been a lot higher, but because of this big overfunding in the allowance account, the provision expense didn't have to happen. And so it looks like earnings are a lot better than they really should be. Um, I have seen plenty of credit unions that have had to make big adjustments to their allowance account just because of a math error. Um, a formula got overwritten or somebody, you know, typed in something wrong somewhere. And, and that's, I hate when that happens, but sometimes it does happen and it will cause a big expense to be made. Um, so to try to avoid those situations, um, you should be having a periodic verification validation of your methodology. That's something that you should be doing anyway have somebody, a third party, uh, an independent person looking at the methodology, looking at your loss factors and Q&E factors and checking the math. Um, doesn't have to be the same person that's checking that math, but it's really important. And I, I'm, I'm really serious about the fact that I've had to, I've had to have a credit union make a huge provision expense a couple of times um, because of a math error. And it really, it really hurt. Um, it really hurt their financial position. Um, and, you know, I hated to see that happen.
Um, you've got to fund it immediately based on the results of that methodology. And I've seen credit unions have a policy that says if they're within, if the balance of the allowance count is within 5% or whatever it is um, of what the methodology says, then you don't have to fund it. But I, I'm fine with that personally. Um, but as a general rule, you can't spread out the funding uh, over a period of time. If it says you need $100,000 in there, you got to fund it $100,000. Um, you want to make sure that you are documenting your evaluation, your ongoing evaluation of your Q&E factors um, so that they make sense. We can understand where you're getting those numbers from, that they're reasonable, that sort of thing. I'm going to charge off loans timely always. Um, and that is all I have for you today. Um, we've saved a good amount of time, hopefully, for q and A. I know I went through that pretty fast. I wanted to hit the high points so that we had time for questions. So, Allie, with that, um, I'm going to turn it back over so we can get into our Q&A. All right. Thank you so much, Sonia. I know I was following along and I found lots of that incredibly helpful. Um, it, it made me think all the way back to my accounting classes in, in college and I was like, whoa, that's what that means. <laughs> Good. <laughs> so even I, you know, even I'm learning stuff from this, so it's great. Um, and you're right. We did actually have a, uh, a couple questions come in during your presentation, just looking for a little bit more advice. And so I am going to turn it over to my counterpart on the training team, Ron Good, who, as always, does an amazing job leading us through the Q&A session. So I'm going to turn it over to him for that now. Ron, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us again for Q&A. Great, thank you uh, so much, Allie. Thank you, Sonia, for a great presentation. And I wanna thank Chris and Ted for joining us. This is, this is gonna be awesome. And we did, I just, just uh, administrative. If you're asking about the PowerPoint slides, we got a lot of those. So just FYI, if you go back to the registration link that you use to register for this webinar, it'll ask you to register again, go ahead and do it. You can download the slides from there. If not, the slides will be uploaded to the learning management system along with a recording of this presentation. So our first question I'm gonna throw at you, Sonia. Um, and the question is, on credit union CD investments that we invest and receive monthly dividends slash or interest, is it a requirement to accrue the dividend or interest or interest? Here's the answer that you're going to get to every question you ever ask an examiner, um, and that is it depends. Um, if you're getting monthly, if you're getting monthly interest, it's not necessarily going to be a material amount to worry about accruing. I mean, if you got all of your interest payments on the first day of the month. Um, then, I mean, technically you should be accruing 30 or 31 days of interest or 29 days of interest and recognizing that at the end of the month. So if you want to do it correctly, you would be accruing for all of the days between when you got that last payment and when and when you get the next payment. Um, if you're if you're working with a CPA, they're going to be able to tell you what they want to see you do. Um, Chris, you have any comments on that? Uh, you're spot on. Uh, basically, under GAAP, you want to accrue from the date of payment until the end of the month. And the larger right. your portfolio, the more um, the more well, more material, more material can be. Uh, on top yes. of it, there's some you know there's some um, fixed uh, income securities that pay uh, by annually or quarterly. So you'll have to you know, take that into consideration also. Oh yeah, I would say definitely you wanna be accruing for those if you're not getting monthly payments. Um, and and if you're, if you're not accruing for those monthly pays, talk to your CPA about it. Very good. Thank you so much, Sonia, and thank you also, Chris. Chris, this next question is for you. 
And it is, is it acceptable to prepare CECL allowance for loan and lease losses calculations quarterly to a coincide with the data NCUA updates quarterly? Okay. Our recommendation has been that if a credit union is you know, prior to CECL was updating their uh, allowance for credit losses or allowance for loan and lease losses monthly, to continue with that gate that to continue with that cadence. That is to keep its financial statements as accurate as possible. Now we've had smaller credit unions come to us and say, hey, you know, we only did this quarterly in the past. Uh, can we continue to do it quarterly? And that is, yes, uh, you know, if you're we're updating the allowance every quarter, uh, you can continue to update it quarterly to be to coincide with the tool. However, for those who uh, had a cadence of doing it monthly. You know, every month you updated your allowance for credit losses on loans and leases. Uh, you would use the last tool that was published and just update the balances uh, for what was what is those balances as at month end. And uh, do you queue any adjustments and uh, come up with the final number to adjust your allowance to allowance for credit losses on loans and leases too? That's a tongue, that's kind of a tongue twister, isn't it? <laughs> yes, it is. I think you should get extra credit for saying that so well. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay, our next question I, I'll throw to either one of you. Uh, and the question is, we are required to have an annual financial statement audit. Under the matching principle of accounting, shouldn't we accrue the cost of the annual financial statement within the calendar year to be audited? I'll take that one. Okay, so this is a gray area and different accountants have different uh, viewpoints. Uh, in general, the idea of the matching principle is, you know, we match our revenue to the expenses to the period of the benefit. And with like an audit, you know, an audit or any other type of expense, it's usually like viewed as like a period expense. It's a, you know, applied to the period of where the audit is performed. However, there's a practical expedient where uh, to what this gentleman, uh, to what this individual pointed out as, you know, amortizing it or uh, accruing for it over the year. Uh, probably the difference between the period costs on a year to date basis and the, I'm sorry, probably the, the difference year to date, uh, whether it's uh, amortized monthly or going through. Uh, the period of performance to say the audit was done December 31st. And uh, so the audit period is December 31st, that year end, and it's done in January, February, March. You know, for this quarter, yes, it's a higher expense, but over the entire year, it's the same amount. So, like a practical expedient is a common thing, which is it's almost gap, but it gives us pretty much the same answer on a year to date basis. And that's often happens uh, as we try to. Um, well, have some type of administrative ease for uh, making all these sometimes harder accounting transactions uh, not, drive us, not drive us crazy. Understood. Thank you very, very much. All right. Our next question is, if we repossess and sell within 90 days, do we have to write down and transfer to foreclosed and repossessed assets? I can answer this one. Okay. Uh, actually, I'm, I'm reviewing. I'm I'm looking at my notes right now, so I can answer this correctly. Uh, if an asset is sold shortly after it is received, in a restructuring, foreclosure, or re repossession, it would generally be appropriate to substitute the value received in the sale for its you know estimated net cost. That is a fair value minus the cost to sell. So if it's very quick, that's generally acceptable. Again, also um, go back and you know work with your accountant uh, to make sure that they're on with it. But in general, the gap is, you know, the gap requirement is once you have possession of that asset, you recognize that loss to the allowance for credit losses, and then going forward after you have possession of that asset, then any gain or loss, or uh, any well, any loss on disposition goes to the, was it the other 
uh, other gains and losses on fixed assets. Um, to the point that there are uh, going forward to the point that the, um, there are gains and losses uh, above uh, after the uh, foreclosure. You can only recognize gains up to the amount of your write down. Uh, but when you sell, you can recognize gains and losses. That is, um, once you foreclose and you recognize the adjustment to allowance for gains and losses, you can write, you know, if the value decreases more, you write it down, um, you adjust it through your other gains and losses on foreclosed assets, but you can only write up to the amount that you've written down. And then when you go to dispose of the asset, you do the, the final true up and that flushes through your other, you know, gains and losses. Wow, Chris, I'm impressed. Thank you. Good job. <laughs> Good job. I try. I'm impressed with both of you. I took accounting as an elective just because I was good at math, and I almost regretted it after I did it. <laughs> but I admire how well both of you uh, have uh, mastered this art. So our next question, our next question is, uh, where is the best place to find resources for the accounting of foreclosed slash repossessed assets. It seems like there are many scenarios, so examples are helpful. Uh, that's a very good question, and it is an amorphous area. Uh, there are a lot of good uh, resources with uh, the accounting firms out there, and some accounting firms will have a um, a guide that you can uh, that will go examples. Uh, also, um, through the AICPA, they have uh, publications. Uh, my favorite publication that covers a lot of different things is, and this is not a recommendation, it's my personal opinion, but not a recommendation or endorsement, is the Guide on Depository Institutions. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you. <laughs> Our next question is, are there standard Q and E factors for credit unions? Um, I can answer that one, and bear with me. Uh, within our simplified CISO tool, on tab four, we have a few Q and E adjustments, and we'd like to call that a starting point. You know, qualitative and uh, how do you put it? Uh, environmental. Or we just call them qualitative nowadays after Cecil. These are good starting points. However, just always take a step back and say, is there something else that we should really include as a qualitative adjustment that affects our loan portfolio? And it may not be uh, the economy. It may not be um, selling new products. It may actually have to do with the field of membership. Maybe you have some particular um, type of membership union teachers where that type of field of membership creates a stress that should be factored into uh, your estimate for credit losses. Thank you, Chris. Um, our next question is, what is considered a selling cost for a foreclosure repossession? Foreclosure or repossession? Uh, usually, uh, I'm just trying to think of, I'm just trying to think a little bit out loud here. Uh, usually it's the commissions, uh, the cost of let's see the commissions, the cost of any 3rd party handling the property. Uh, at the, you know, when, when you foreclose a property, usually a institution has their policy or their process for taking that asset and. Uh, selling it, and usually in that there are uh, a bunch of different types of expenses that occurred to get that uh, item sold, get that asset sold. Uh, those would be the types of costs that would be your your selling costs. I'm going to reach out to I'm going to phone a friend here. So yeah, <laughs> did I miss anything? <laughs> I mean, you know, keeping the grass mode or painting yes. a wall or, you know, anything like that, that you have to spend to get it ready to sell or to maintain it while it's on the market. 
Got it. Thank you. So we're almost out of time. There's there's two questions I want to try to get answered. Um, and they are, can we keep a bad loan on the books for 180 days? And the other one is, what is considered timely charge-offs? I can speak to those. Um, so we do not have any hard and fast rules about when a loan has to be charged off. Um, FDIC does have some rules under some cir circumstances, um, and I know, you know, when we get people that come to us from the banking industry, they kind of have that 180 days um, marked um, in their DNA. <laughs> so, but no, we do not have a, a hard and fast rule. Now, if you have a loan on the books that is 180 days delinquent, you're going to have to have some extenuating circumstances and some um, evidence to make to convince me that that is a performing asset that should be reflected on your financial statements. Um, it, there has to have been some change in the circumstance where, you know, they're back to work and paying again, and they've been paying for a while. I mean, there, you know, something has had, has to have happened uh, for me, for you to convince me of that. Um, but yeah, there's, there's not a hard and fast rule. Uh, what was the second Oh, timely. Um, what is a timely charge off? Yes. Um, well, well, it depends. Okay. Because we don't have those hard and fast rules and every credit union can come up with their own uh, charge off policies. Um, but those policies should be reasonable. They should make sense. They should give people looking at your financial statements a, a confidence that your total loans on your financial statements represent performing loans. That's, that's the whole thing. Um, and that's subjective. It's a subjective uh, number, but, um, it, and the word reasonable, you know, it's, it's subjective. So sometimes there's some negotiations around that, but, um, and your CPA, if you if you're uh, working with CPA, they're going to have their own opinions about what is timely and what is not. Understood. Chris, you got any, got anything else about that, Chris? No, you, you hit, you're spot on with uh, having a policy, having a policy that you consistently apply. Uh, again, consistently apply. I'm I'm more lean towards, um, you know, charging it off at the point where. Um, you know, there's a bankruptcy, there's some event um, makes it, you know, makes the probability of not recovery um, probable, probably more than 70%. Uh, you know, facts and circumstances, you know, loan by loan. However, have a policy deep to it and, you know, and that will create consistent financial reporting. Our worry is, is that if a policy is not consistently applied, then to Sonia, Sonia's earlier point is, you know, there's, there may be some loans on the books that look like they're performing, but they're not, which are overstating the financial performance of the credit union. Excellent. Thank you both very much. I'm sure that was very helpful. That is all the time we have for our Q&A. So any questions, we did get a few more questions that we were not able to answer. But we will send them to our, our speakers, our experts, and we'll post their answers to those questions to the learning management system. Yes, Chris. I just want to add a plug. Uh, if you do have any questions, you can also send them to eimail at ncua.gov. Again, the initials EI and mail all together at ncua.gov, and they will make their way to me and our staff. Excellent. Thank you, Chris. Well, and and you can also check the learning management system for any you submitted today. But you know, go ahead and send them to Chris. You might get a better answer. I don't know. But anyway, they'll be posted to the learning management system when we post the recording as well as the PowerPoint. I want to thank our wonderful speakers one more time. Allie, I turn it back over to you. Thank you so much, Ron, and thank you for leading us do that.
that Q and A session. It was fantastic as always. I appreciate you joining us to to always lead that Q and A session. Thank you to Chris and Sonia for that as well. Um, like I said, it was a great Q and A session. Um, I appreciated the the back and forth phone a friend as well. So you know, it just goes to show sometimes you still always need that buddy buddy to help out with that. So I, I do appreciate that. Um, we'll go ahead and close up with our closing announcements just because I do want to be respectful of everybody's time. So we have just one uh, thing, really major thing I want to say going on for uh, here at the moment, and it is our annual MDI symposium. So that is just two weeks away. So credit unions with the MDI designation are invited to join us in Durham, North Carolina for a three day conference filled with lots of great information, technical sessions, presentations from fellow MDI credit unions. Um, the event is completely free. Of course, uh, you just have to, you know, show up, get there. Um, um, and of course, the hotel uh, reserve a hotel room, of course, but the event itself, there is no cost for registration. So if you are an MDI with that designation, uh, credit union with that designation, I encourage you, please reach out to CureMDI at ncua.gov um, to be able to start that process if you are interested in attending. Like Ron mentioned, and I mentioned as well several times throughout our presentation today, everything that we discussed today, so our slides, a closed caption copy of this recording, um, as well as a copy of any unanswered Q&A questions will go up on our learning management system. Chris also plugged E and I mail at ncoa.gov. So if you do have any additional questions that you did not get to ask during this webinar, um, I do recommend reaching out to E and I mail uh, at NCOA.gov. Gov, just because what will go on our learning management system will just be the questions that were not we were not able to get to during today's webinar. So anything beyond that, I do really encourage that and want to plug that as well. But please, as always, please register for our learning management system. Like I said, it is completely free. We have over 300 courses. We touch on things like the Cecil tool, accounting, um, other accounting pr uh, principles as well. So we have great, a great resource available to you. And then I'll close out with contact information. So the Office of Credit Union Resources and Expansion is divided into two divisions. Our Division of Consumer Access handles any questions and any items related to chartering, field of membership expansion, um, share insurance fund. So if you have any questions, please reach out to the Division of Consumer Access. You can use CureMail at ncua.gov um, to be able to reach out or any of the additional email addresses and contact information provided. We also have the resources division, which is where Ron and I are a part of. So our, we are holding down the training team. We also work with fantastic individuals who help with CDFI certification, grants and loans, and the MDI preservation program. So if you have any questions or any way that we can support you, please reach out to us. We are always happy to assist. Um, I do also want to take a moment today to thank our support staff who joined us. So Franz, who is our technical support, he he assists with anything and everything when it comes to this webinar. So I always want to take a moment to give him a shout out. Um, again, I want to thank Ron for leading us through our Q&A session, Christy for joining us today and providing opening remarks. Trey was also in the background assisting with questions to be able to assist with Chris and Sonia. And of course, one last big thank you to Chris and Sonia. Sonia for a great presentation and Chris for being on standby to assist with any and all questions that came in as well. So thank you again to the entire team for coming together for this webinar. I know it means a lot to our viewers and to our viewers. I just want to say thank you so much for your time and attendance and for joining us. I know we went just a couple minutes over that 3 p.m. time, but I want to say thank you guys again, and I hope that you all have a great rest of your day and I'll see you at our next webinar. Have a good night, everybody.